All right. First question this week comes from Michael from Australia. Match boxers. Thanks for the great podcast. I am a month away from my A event, the three-stage tour of Bright, and currently find myself with more time on my hands at the moment while I'm not working. I typically average 10 to 11 hours a week with a structured training plan and was wondering if I was to add more volume at this point up to 13 to 15 hours a week, where should I be doing this to maximize my potential for this A event? The event consists of a 94K rolling road race, 18K ITT, and 39K mountain stage. Uh, 57 years old, lifetime endurance athlete, just under four watts per kilo. Uh, and been racing bikes for six years. Oh, and they also have a nine-day holiday two weeks before the event where I can ride more and do some heat adaptation. So um, basically, Michael wants to know if he's a month out from his A event, where should he spend his extra time training? How how far out is the holiday? Uh, the holiday is two weeks before the event. Two weeks. Ooh, that's perfect. Um, I'm becoming more and more a believer of high volume blocks every single year that I'm alive (laughs) because they just keep making me stronger. (laughs) Um, yeah, I'm so, I'm such a huge believer of high volume blocks at this point. Um, in fact, if there's anything that I'm changing about my training next year, it's, I will, I will be doubling down on high volume blocks. Um. And, you know, I think that there's, there's, uh, arguments to be made that, you know, maybe that doesn't apply for all types of racing and maybe because I'm a, you know, an endurance gravel racer, like some of these gravel races are extremely long. It works particularly well for me, but, um, yeah, I'm, that's, that's like what I credit most of my gains over the past three years to. So break down a little bit what your high volume blocks look like how often you're doing it what the weekly structure looks like and how it's uh like what that high volume is relative to typical volume just so we can kind of start to apply this to michael's question here yeah sure so uh the most notable high volume block that i did in the season was right before unbound um but i also had because the unbound block was a two-week block and then the other blocks that i did in the year were just a one week uh, so I did a block before Leadville that was one week, and then I think I did a block shortly after Leadville that was one week. Um, okay. So I would say that on a typical training week, I'm, that's not like in the middle of the race season, but just a typical typical training week, I'd say in the build up to this season, my volume would probably be twenty to twenty five hours. Um. And I would say the minimum for me to consider it a high volume block would be 30. Uh, So like 30 hours in a week. But that's the minimum. Like this year for my unbound block, which was a two week, uh, two week volume block, I did 35 hours of training in the first week and 40 hours of training in the second week. So 75 hours total in two weeks which is pretty significantly, that's a pretty significant increase over my normal volume for a pretty extended period of time, two weeks. And uh, I realized that by saying this, some, you know, people are going to be like, oh yeah, just double my volume for two weeks. That'll be fine. Uh, That is what you (laughs) <laughs> that is what you just said. <laughs> That's what you just said. I normally well, train twenty hours, and I did forty. Well, I said yeah, twenty to twenty-five, said. and he did. So in two weeks, he did seventy-five hours compared yeah. to let's say a you know standard higher volume two-week block would have been fifty hours. So it's actually over two weeks, you've increased by about fifty percent. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, right. Um, this is definitely something that you have to experiment with, and it's better to be on the more cautious side than just like you know, going all in on your very first volume block. So for let, let's take this guy, for example. If his Yeah, let's nor- take this guy because I don't think he needs a volume block. Did you listen to like what the stages are? They're so short. The first one is a road stage. It's 94K, okay. But then it's an 18K TT and then a 39K mountain stage. They're short. Mm-hmm. I would feel like a intensity block week. 
And yeah, he can bump up the volume. His average is 10 hours, 10 to 11 hours, and he wants to go to 13 to 15 hours. Like, do an intensity block and like also bump up the volume a little bit. But I think doing, sorry, I didn't mean to steal your thunder. You no, can go continue. For it. I'll go come for back it. later. I'm with Caitlin. I mean, what are what are your thoughts? <laughs> I, <laughs> what are your I'm, thoughts on that? So you, if you had asked me this a year ago, I probably would have been in agreement. I'd be like, yeah, the race that he's doing is not that long. Like, go for intensity block over volume block. I don't know, man. I think I would go for volume block. I think I would. Honestly, this is. I'm not. I'm. I want to be clear right now. Like I'm. I'm such a research heavy guy, and I'm not basing this opinion off of research right now. I'm very much basing it off of my own experience. So I, I want. I want to throw that out there to be clear. Um, this is. This is something that I'm saying based off of personal experience, not necessarily research. Because honestly, there isn't research on volume blocks. There's research on block periodization with intensity. But there's not research on volume blocks that I know of. Maybe maybe some has has come out since the last time I looked into this. But um, but yeah, like I just just this is this is again an end of one anecdote. But arguably the the race of the lifetime Grand Prix that required the the most intensity training would have been Schwamigen. It's a two hour race, very punchy climbs. You know, you're constantly doing VO2 max efforts throughout the entire race. Uh, that was my second best result of the season. And I did a volume block like two weeks out from that race. Like I did a 30 hour week, two weeks out for that race. And I, and my, honestly, my thought process was like, ah, Schwamigan will probably be like, I'm not going to train specifically for Schwamigan. I'm just going to train as if I'm training for the rad and big sugar, because I care more about the rad and big sugar. And uh, we all know how that went, but <laughs> Schwamigan went great. Schwamigan was my second best Grand Prix result of the year. And it was two weeks after a 30 hour week where I didn't do much intensity. Like I I'm, I'm really honestly shifting my thinking on, on the types of races that can benefit from a volume block. Hmm. At least for me personally, I get, I know this is an end of one anecdote here, but I, this guy having a nine day holiday two weeks before this event. And I know that this event isn't super long, although uh, the first day could probably be three or four hours, depending on how fast this guy's going. Um, we also have to keep in mind that this is success like successive days so i think a volume block also helps with that because you're used to you know riding under heavy fatigue um i don't know i mean i i can see how the argument goes both ways and honestly like prescribing an intensity block is not a bad idea either in my opinion although if you were to do an intensity block i think i'd do it a little sooner than two weeks out maybe three weeks out would be optimal for that yeah, but and, for the and, volume and if block, you were going to do an intensity block, you wouldn't want to stack a volume block afterwards. So, so no. your mm -hmm. nine day holiday would would have to just be like a normal training week. You wouldn't you wouldn't want to take yeah. advantage of that extra time and stack on more volume because that that would definitely when when you come out of an intensity block, it takes some time to crawl out of it. It's not just like you can't just stack on another high volume week. Um, I almost think that you could probably do two weeks of high volume easier than you would be able to do like a week of high intensity like a intensity block followed by a high volume block i think that would be problematic mm -hmm. yeah, but one absolutely. thing i want to point out here too so you know you're talking about your own anecdote which i think is valid anecdote is you know something that we we all bring as as you know elite athletes or former elite athletes like we have our own experiences to lean on uh but one thing for you like you're training at a high volume. So a lot of people would look at someone who's already training at high volume and think, well, what, what's something that this athlete should do to mix it up and, you know, get some, you know, additional couple percentage improvements in performance and, and maybe think like, oh, well, Dylan's only doing intensity two days a week. He should bump that up to three or four days a week and like get a fitness bump from that. Right. That, that's what mm -hmm. a lot of people think, even just for their own selves is like, I just need to do more intensity. Um, but you've proven with the last few years that, really what's been most beneficial is actually doing more volume, not more intensity. 
And for yeah. someone like Michael, who's doing on average 10 hours a week, you know, which I would consider to be like mid-level volume, uh, I think there's actually probably more to gain for him from doing a high volume week versus doing high intensity week. I Yeah, I absolutely agree. I feel like the the last couple of episodes, we've had some conversation about volume every single time. Um, and I think if you're a regular listener of this podcast, you can probably recognize trends that at least, at least I am very big on volume, extremely big on volume. Um, which I, I think is sometimes not what people want to hear because they've got busy schedules and they can't, they, they, they just can't fit in 20 hours of training in a week. They go, you know, that's extremely rare to be able to actually do that kind of training in a week. But, um, I just, I, well, Michael can, right. I mean, like in this case, Michael yeah. has a nine day holiday two weeks before his event. Like I, right. I, I'm kind of on the same page as you, Dylan. I think, I think that works out perfectly in this case here. And, and, you know, Michael's doing 10, 10 to 11 hours a week on average, mm -hmm. uh, with his structured training, um, you know, I would say maybe over a nine day period, you know, instead of, you don't, you don't want to train every day, high volume for nine days. Maybe you break that up into, uh, you know, like three days on one day off three days on or something like that, or two on one off, two on one off, two on something, something like that. Like you can kind of, you know, mix it up, but, um, I would say over nine days, you could probably try to aim for 20 hours. Um, mm -hmm. that seems like a lot compared to his 10 hours, but you've got two extra days in there too. So yeah, if you could turn that nine day holiday into a 20 hour volume block, I think that would be, that would be perfect. Yeah, I agree. And then how, so you've got two weeks after that before your race. This is exactly how I would do those two weeks after the volume <laughs> block, take pretty solid recovery. I would say the next five days should be pretty easy and pretty short. Like we're talking about recovery rides for five days. Uh, you know, like probably take the, the first day completely off and then four days of recovery rides afterwards. And then that weekend, um, just sharpen, just sharpen the spear for, for the racing. And what I mean by that is like, do some VO2 max efforts, maybe do some 30 thirties, uh, you know, do some high intensity efforts just to, just to sharpen up for the race. And then you're into your taper week. Cool. I guess, uh, we don't think hat heat adaptation would be beneficial at all. Like well, he, he he was obviously thinking about doing some heat adaptation training somehow because he mentioned that in his question. And but you guys are saying it would be way more beneficial for him to go and focus on volume rather than heat. Uh, or both. I, I think heat ap adaptation would be beneficial. I guess I just, I just yeah, we just got, haven't got out of that part that yet. yet. <laughs> yeah, no, I I think heat adaptation would be beneficial too. I think because this guy lives in Australia. Uh, I'm thinking that it's getting hot there. I mean, I don't live in Australia, so I don't know, but the seat, the seasons are reversed, so it should be getting hot there. I mean, I, the difficulty with doing, I, if you're trying to do some heat adaptation specific block where you're, I don't know, going to the sauna and riding on the trainer with like a jacket on or, or whatever you're trying to do to heat acclimate, I wouldn't do that at the same time as the volume block because Agreed. it's probably too much stress for your body. But, you know, when I'm, I, I, I think at the very least, what you can do is if you can ride at any part of the day during your holiday, just ride in the middle of the day when it's hot. Like, don't try to escape the heat. Just, just ride in the heat, embrace it. Yeah. I mean, one thing I was going to add, so I, I agree, Dylan, for sure. You don't want, like, you don't want to throw too many different stimuli on your body at one time. And if you're doing high volume, that's already going to be fatiguing enough. You don't want to stack on like overloading it with heat adaptation during that time. Uh, but, but he mentions having extra time on his hands currently, like leading up to that nine day holiday. And I'd almost say like, if you're going to do dedicate, like something dedicated, like if you, you know, if going to the sauna is going to be part of your heat protocol, maybe use that extra time in the le weeks leading up to that nine day holiday break where you're starting that heat adaptation process then. So that way, when you do get into the holiday break, you're already somewhat acclimated and it's not going to have as much like fatiguing effect when you do go out and ride in the heat, like Dylan's talking about. 
um, just so you're not overwhelming your body during that nine-day period. And you mentioning that he has extra time on his hands now, that's why I was leaning toward the intensity block because he can currently mm. start to increase his volume now. It'll be more subtle than doubling total time, but he can go from 10 to 13, then 13 to 15, mm. and then still do like a, a five-day intensity block and recover before the race. That's how I would do it. Sure. But I think I think I think that that definitely is a route to go to. I would say if you've got a nine day holiday that ends two weeks from the race, I would do if you're going to do an intensity block, I would do a five day block at the beginning of the holiday and mm -hmm. then take the the remaining four days to just chill and have a nice holiday. Whoa. Is Dylan suggesting someone should do something other than riding their bikes <laughs> during a holiday? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but only yeah. because it only because it benefits his performance. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I I know Michael, you're getting some conflicted responses here. Uh, yeah, you honestly, can take this I, yeah, a I mean, lot of different ways. I don't. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's I mean, not one, there's, there's not a... one way to skin a cat, right? Like, right. You can. There's different ways to go about this. So. Yeah, I think the the closer you get to an A event, the riskier it is to do an intensity block, and this is somewhat coming from experience just having done a bunch of intensity blocks at this point, um, the timing of that can be hit or miss. Sometimes you peak three weeks after or two weeks after. Sometimes you don't peak till five weeks after. Like it, the timing of it can be tricky. Uh, so I do think there's a little bit more risk there, but maybe, I mean, you might know more about the stages too or the dynamics of the race. You know, maybe the intensity block might make more sense or maybe it's easier for you to implement, but... Um, I think we gave you two pretty good options and I don't, I don't know that you could necessarily go wrong either way, unless you like just do too much and definitely don't try and do both. Don't do the intensity block and the volume block. That's, that'd probably be a big mistake. And I think everything we've suggested so far is somewhat risky for a 57 year old who's talking about That's increasing, a good point too. increasing his training regardless of his volume or intensity, he's going to increase his training one way or another. Plus he's 57 years old. So he recovers. And to sum it up, dude, when you get older, it takes longer to recover. So uh, whether that's from intensity or from volume, it's going to take longer to recover. But it doesn't mean it's not going to be beneficial. It just means it is risky. I mean, sometimes you got to risk it for the biscuit, man. It's your yeah, event. I mean, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying totally <laughs> yeah. do it because it could, you know, uh, it could pay off big time. Um, but like you guys hinted at, like, don't don't neglect the recovery aspect of it especially yeah. given his age. You know, and, and I mean, it's actually like a good point. I mean, I, I know I just said that kind of half jokingly, but I think a lot of people treat A events each year like it's the last A event they'll ever get to do mm. and they don't want to screw it up and everything has to go perfect. But every single time you line up for a race, the preparation leading in should have been a learning experience. So like if you try the high volume block this year and you come into, you know, this A event and you're somewhat flat, Maybe you learn that, hey, the high volume block wasn't it for me, you know, or vice versa if you try the intensity block. Um, but if you want to get better, like you have to try something like, you yeah, know, yeah. that, that, oh, that yeah. is how you move the needle. So, yeah, I, I think that's a great point because um, I, I want to emphasize that if you if you keep doing the same thing that you've always been doing, you will be the same speed that you've always been. You're not going to improve. Yeah. So if you're doing 10 hours a week with two interval sessions per week and you're like, well, I can't fit in more volume, like it's just, and you just keep, keep pounding away at that same volume level and intensity level, you, you're not, go you're not going to break through that ceiling. Like you, you do yeah. have to do something more or something different in order to see improvement. I kind of think that like when people hire a coach, they expect the coach to tell them some special to give them some special sauce that's going to help them to to keep doing what they're doing and somehow get better like what you just said but a coach is just going to tell you everything we're telling you because we're all coaches too so like they're going to tell you to increase your volume and increase your intensity it's just now you're paying somebody and they're holding you accountable and so the level of like seriousness goes up a big notch and that's like that's the big that's one of the big benefits of having a coach is just like the 
the motivation that comes with having a coach, like somebody actually telling you, Hey, you need to go do this. For sure. Mm -hmm. And, and the objective perspective, you know, like we've talked about this too, is everyone has bias towards what they want to do and what they like to do versus maybe what they need to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, coach is going to come in and hopefully be able to break down like, okay, this is what you've been doing. You're kind of stuck in this pattern. I know you like to do this sort of workout, but we've got to deviate from that to move the needle. So if you're interested in coaching, check out the Ignition Coach Co. website, sign up with our athlete form. We, we use the info from your athlete form to connect you to a coach that's best suited for you and your goals. There you go. Yep. <laughs> How many coaches do we have right now? 23. Wow. Whoa. That's so that's crazy. good because the more coaches we have means um, the more likely it is that you're going to get paired with a coach that is very like cued in on your specific goals. Like if somebody, if I already know this, like if anybody mentions the race Shenandoah 100 on their athlete form, which has happened a handful of times, I immediately give them to Caitlin because Caitlin's won that race. And I'm like, oh she'll she'll be able to help you win that race too because she's done it. <laughs> like that's the that's the kind of stuff that we look for on that athlete form because i think that's like where the where the special i don't know i think that's where the special sauce is because like when a coach can give you specific details on events that they've done or just know a lot about then um they're going to be a better coach for you for sure i've podiumed i haven't won i just gotta throw that out there oh, dang. i've been telling people for years that you've won that race oh, come on. <laughs> if you take well, away those other riders whatever she won. <laughs> you get they get they still the same the same still applies yeah you've done well thanks uh okay cool let's move on to this next question here uh this is a fun one this comes from caleb hey guys i'm relatively new to riding and been training for three years. My current FTP is 290 watts at 65 kilos. I'm 27 and I've set the goal of racing in the elite category by 30. Not winning or anything, just being able to confidently register for races that are in this category. My schedule is three days straight of riding, then the following four days working. I lift weights once a week on a once a week on a weekday. I can ride as long as I want during those three days. A regular week would be something like two six to seven hour zone two rides followed by a four hour interval day intervals are usually something like three by 20 ftp or four by eight at 110 percent ftp uh, with a couple zone two hours afterwards i can recover pretty well from increasing the volume as i do for bigger training blocks do you guys think my goal is attainable or would i have to change my schedule to have a chance Thanks, everybody. Love the podcast. I'm super grateful that you offer all of this for free. Well, he's currently at four and a half watts per kilo. So that's pretty good. Um, Man, I don't like his schedule. <laughs> I tell him <laughs> straight up. Like, that sucks. Three days on, four days off. That's like... So I'm not saying it's impossible. How, that's hard. What, what kind of writing is he able to do during that four-day period? That's what I was wondering. I mean, it, it impl I would imply from the way he wrote the question, none. Maybe a gym session. It sounds like maybe he does his gym session on a weekday, which would maybe... That's yeah, correlate. so my guess is, is, is Caleb's probably working like a 410 work schedule. So, you know, maybe Monday through Thursday, working 10 hours a day, plus commute and... You know, what it sounds like. Preparation, everything, you know? So it's like probably just doesn't uh. have time to, for much writing. Yeah, no, that I I'm in agreement. If if you actually can't <laughs> ride for four days, uh, I'm in agreement with Drew. That's pretty awful. Like um, you're detrain. I mean, like I I don't know how accurate this is, but all growing up, the coach that I had for years was like, you can't take more than two days off because at that point you're detraining. So like that's been kind of ingrained into my head, and I don't know how true that is, but four days. Yeah, that's, well, that's a lot. That's I mean, you're, a not, you're, not, you're not undoing everything in four days. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but it's it's not productive. I I think the sure. biggest thing is that your blood volume will decrease in four days. Uh, so you, then you're getting you're starting off your three day block on a bad foot. Like you're starting off your three day block with decreased blood volume. Um, meaning uh, that you probably the... can't do your intervals as hard as if you had done a light ride for four days. 
you know, this like is the kind yeah. of science that people are looking for from DJ Dylan Johnson. Yeah. Blood volume? Where'd you pull that from? I've never heard you talk about blood volume ever. Okay. And I've been your friend for like four years. Never heard you mention blood volume. What do you mean blood volume? I only talk about tire volume, dude. Yeah, what the heck is blood volume? Like now I'm interested. It's like, the volume what... of red blood cells that you have. And it and so you're saying that when we ride or when we ride that stays high. So your your blood volume can increase and decrease pretty quickly with training and detraining. De um, and it's one of the first things to go when you stop training. And in mm. four days, your blood that's an four days is enough time for your blood volume to decrease. Is it so I'm assuming it, it's aerobic because of its blood? Yeah. And red blood cells. So like him going to the gym on one or two of those days no. isn't helping his blood volume. No. That's why I kind of want to suggest, I hate that I'm suggesting this, but you can squeeze in some like maintenance stuff as activation before your ride and sub that like full blown strength session out for like, maybe mm. you can't ride, but maybe you can ride. run. Oh, run. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Now we're talking. Some... Cause it's still aerobic. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you check the box for aerobic and the blood volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that specific, but... I think that what we're getting at here is that you really need to be doing something aerobic during that four day period. You should not take four days off completely every single week. That's that's that 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 is that is harming your training a lot. Yeah. yeah. So maybe like the I don't know best case scenario if he can't change his schedule. I would say he bookends those four days with with off days or re recovery days, but the two middle days of when he's working, assuming it sounds like they're four days back to back to back. So like the two days in the middle would be the days that you would try to get something in. I, mm -hmm. To me, that seems like the best. Yeah, option. I, I kind of like Caitlin's suggestion of moving that because obviously Caleb is able to fit in the strength session. Uh into the you know into one of those four days it doesn't say which one but uh, I kind of like that idea of moving that and then subbing that out for something <clears throat> else that's aerobic um, like if you're going to the gym that means you already and maybe you've got a home gym it doesn't matter but like you're already investing that time and I agree I think that time would be better spent doing something aerobic and I think cross training is a great suggestion um, you might not get very much and, and, and in this case, I think a 30 minute even trainer ride is going to be way better than not doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, but you might get more out of a 30 minute run or, you know, yeah, something for something sure. else. Mm -hmm. And it's just more convenient sometimes. Maybe it's on the trainer and trainer can be super convenient. And if you don't have an at home trainer set up where you can just hop on really easily, that that would be like the first step would be to improving your barrier to entry on these four weekdays. Um, but, you know, if you can't do that, then, yeah, something like running or rowing at the gym or something like that uh, would be would be another option. I'm about to I make a go ahead. No, you go. I'm about to make like a pretty big oversimplification, but there's 24 hours in the day. He's working 10 hours and sleeping eight hours. This is an assumption. Maybe he's working 12 hours a day. I don't know. But uh, yeah, either four, way, he's working tens, a lot. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. That still leaves you. Oh, crap. I'm so bad. Now I'm like on the spot. So that's eight, that's 10, 18, 18 hours and he's got <laughs> six hours. Yeah, you to got do whatever six you extra want. hours to, to do whatever you want. Surely <laughs> you can. Don't know that. He, maybe he maybe, surely maybe you can, he's got a kid. You don't know. Give him a four, all right, I'll give him a four hour buffer. That still leaves two hours a day. Maybe, for maybe him he's to, working 15 hours and sleeping eight. And the other hours spent that's one more, one extra hour. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I said oversimplification assumptions there, but I guess the point I'm making is like, if you have big goals, they require big commitment. And it just I think it all kind of falls down on like, how bad do you want to be racing in the elite category by the time you're 30? If it's bad yeah. enough, then you can you'll make yeah. you'll change your priorities and, and make make riding on two of those work days a possibility or you'll change your schedule. Um, also, I want because he gave us very specific numbers and the elite category is a category that I can compete in. I want to I want to kind of give him an idea of what oh yeah. like how realistic this is and what is what is needed. If he's talk I I'm assuming he's talking about is is this guy from the US? 
Uh, does Doesn't not say. say. Okay. Probably. Let's let's assume so. I mean, all of our international people usually put where they're from. So <laughs> true. true. Um, I mean, I would say that to like you should you probably want to be at five watts per kilo to compete in the elite category. Um, you probably it again it depends on what race we're talking about um but i would say five watts per kilo to compete in the elite category probably five and a half watts per kilo to be competitive meaning that you're you're have a shot at the podium if things go well for you and then to win it's pro we're probably talking about uh around six yep um, yeah, and, and how... especially as a so so Caleb says he's sixty five kilos. Mm -hmm. The the smaller and lighter you are, I think the more power to weight matters for you. Um, you know, like some bigger riders. Let's say you've got a you know a guy who's you know seventy five or eighty kilos, but has a four hundred watt FTP. You know, so they're barely pushing that five hundred or five watt per kilo mark. But they've got 400, 400 watts to work with. Like that 400 watts is going to go a lot further than 200 and, or 320 watts, yeah. whatever you would need to be to be at five watts per kilo. So I, that, yeah, I think that has to be accounted for here too. He also doesn't mention what style yeah. of racing he does. That's true. If he's trying to race in the elite category for crits, I think that's way more attainable than if he was trying to race in the elite category for like a gravel event just because gravel requires sure. so much more volume and if he's already trying to squeeze out as much volume as he can like i know a lot of elite crit guys who who train less than what he's saying on here um and they they do just fine so like um and i think I you know, can manipulate your fitness profile to to be more conducive to like elite crit racing like there's a lot more that goes into it than just power to weight or mm -hmm. you know just you know ctl number um yeah and skill you know skill and pack riding and you know being able to move Efficiency. up in the field like all of that you know can you can work on a lot of other stuff whereas yeah i i agree i think at least domestically elite gravel racing probably requires the most level of fitness just like yeah. pure fitness I'm going to guess based off of how he's training that he, it it seems like he's training for more more for gravel races than he is for like a short. If he's doing six to seven hour zone two rides and he's just doing a lot of 20 and minute a four and hour eight, intensity ride, eight minute efforts. Yeah, it sounds like he's training for gravel or or at least road racing or something longer. Um, yeah. And I, I will say, too, so if he's currently at four and a half watts per kilo and he is at four and a half watts per kilo on the schedule that he's currently on, meaning that he takes four days off every week and that got him to four and a half watts per kilo. In I think three years, too. Yeah, three years. Yeah. I think he's yeah. totally capable of being at five watts per kilo. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. He's at 290 now. At the minimum, to for the numbers that you said, he'd have to bump his FTP up to 330 to like 360. So like a 40, 45 watt increase on FTP in three years. That's 10 to 15 watts a year. That's, yeah, that's, yeah I when, just, you break it I, down, when you break it down like that, it seems attainable. Because I don't think he's currently training optimally is what I'm saying. You know, sure. yeah. like I think yep. there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, yeah. And I think it's important to specify we've been hard on his schedule because of what he's stating that his goals are. Like you got to be able to do more because I know there are people that, are, that will hear this and be like, what do you mean three days of like hard progressive overload, like three days of really hard riding in the sense that like I'm almost doing like a three day stage race every week. You're going to say that I'm not going to get better from doing that. And I think it depends on where you are. Like he's got himself to four and a half watts per kilo. Like you can improve and structure those three days a week to improve. But with what he's trying to do, yeah. yeah. I did I mean, also I, want elite to... elite riders don't take four days off. Yeah, yeah. they don't do that. <laughs> well, yeah, most in of any the time, sport. But... I mean, it doesn't even we're not even yeah. you know yeah. yeah. If you want to be at the elite level, like it, you know. It's hard to imagine getting there with training less days than you are taking days off. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No matter how much did, you're putting into those three days. 
I did want to address his three days because he says he does two six to seven hour rides followed by intervals. And that sounds awful. Like he's going to be, I, I don't, why would you put your intervals on the third day? I mean, maybe yeah. I, I didn't know about the blood volume thing until Dylan mentioned it. But for me, I'd be like, I would put the intervals on day one or day two so that you're more fresh for the intervals. And then for sure, the last day would be as much volume as you can squeeze in on the third day of a three day block. But I don't know, putting your intervals on the third day, I would feel like is bad on all accounts because that's just going to be when you're the most fatigued. You, you know, what, you know, what's crazy is this guy is if if what he's saying is correct, it means that he's doing a 15 to 17 hour week every week, which is decent. 18 I, to 20, I think 18 to 20. Is it 18 to 20? Yeah. Two six to seven hour rides and a four hour ride 12. well two so, so 16 to 18 16. hours 16 to 18 yeah so um, so he's doing 16 to 18 good. hours per week which, which i would say if you are an elite rider at five watts per or let's just say like if his goal was to be competitive in the elite and get to five watts per kilo i would say you can absolutely be an elite rider in in the in the pro field at five watts per kilo on 16 to 18 hours a week that's probably sure. most most of them like yeah. most riders in the elite field at five watts per kilo are probably doing 16 to 18 hours per week but he he's getting to that volume in three days and then doing nothing with the other four days yeah which is kind of crazy to think about i and, and i don't know i mean caleb i don't know what your work situation is but you know, a lot of times people will opt for these 410 schedules. Like if they have the option, they'll opt for the 410 because it's like, oh, I got three day weekend, three days to train and, you know, have unlimited time. If you had the option, I would almost say you might be better off going to a typical nine to five schedule and being able to train two of your weekdays and, and breaking it up. Like if that's what it took in order for you to get, you know, to break up that four day block where you don't where you can't train at all um that might be beneficial all right caleb here's what you need to do you need to <laughs> quit your job and go <laughs> all in because dude it, when you are a regional mid-pack elite racer you've made it i mean like that will replace your full-time job like you need to do that asap and you just need to you just have to for the next three years you have to be dedicated to that Dude, full on. He's going to be able to pay his bills with all that free chamois butter that he gets. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yep. Commitment, dude. <laughs> oh, we've talked about this before. Would you suggest that he get a VO2 <laughs> to test? like see? A VO2 test? test? Yeah, yeah. Nah, nobody should ever get a VO2 <laughs> test, ever. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. Because if it's low, you're going to stop training. Because you're like, wow, I don't have any potential. And if it's high, you're just going to be like, well, dang, I'm not living up to my potential. So, yeah, it's bad. That might be, that might be all, what pushes him over occasions. the edge to make that like change if it's possible no, to a nine to five. Or, okay. Will it took Pfeiffer, Dizzle six months to recover from his VO2 test. <laughs> Will Pfeiffer was on this podcast and he hit me hard like while we were recording. I don't know what episode it was. It was one of the ones that we had Will Pfeiffer on. And he, he was like, yeah, but. He was like, if, 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 if you had had your VO2 tested 10 years ago or five years ago before you had done all this serious training and racing and all this stuff and you found out that it was that low, uh, the point he made was like, you still have trained and you're still racing as an elite racer regardless of whatever your VO2 is. And so aren't you happy that you've, like, you've gotten to this far because you've trained optimally? And I was, I don't know exactly how he worded it, but at the end of it, I was like, dang, you're right. Cause I was trying to make the point of like, if you know your VO2 is low, then just quit now. He's like, dude, that's a terrible perspective because <laughs> you're going to be way happier regardless of what your VO2 is. If you're training and pursuing goals and racing, like for but sure. I think yeah. the only exception to that rule is if you get your VO2 tested and it's insanely high, then in the back of your mind, you know that you have the potential to be extremely Then fast. you quit that job, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would probably be the scenario. Also, yeah. Drew, yeah. Drew, your VO2 is not that low. 
Like you're just you say this every you're time. You're just comparing dude. it to really fast people all the time. Like you I'm never comparing it to all the other pros I have to race against in no, every race. Yeah, but who you I want to beat. But you don't compare it to the slow pros that you're already beating. You always compare it to the fast pros that are winning. A quick quick Google search does Damn, say for it? athletes, a good VO2 max for amateur athletes is around 60, while professional uh, athletes can achieve 70 or higher. Yeah. Dude, you're I'm, right I'm there. Punching, <laughs> punching above my weight. <laughs> you're right there, dude. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I know. I got my, I'm over it now. Like, I don't. Hey, I don't you're just comparing we... yourself to the average male, dude. Forty-two and a half. That's what I mean. Average. Yeah, that's so what, Every time we talk about this, Dylan's like, waters. "Well, you're way better than the average," and I'm like, <laughs> "I don't care about the average. I care about the thirty dudes who beat me every weekend." Yeah, and every single one of them are higher than me. Yeah, but you only care about the ones that beat you. Like you're probably yeah, higher. They're the ones that I. Yeah, you're probably higher than the thirty dudes that you beat. No, not accurate. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. That well, any more tangent. advice for Caleb mm -hmm. here? What about, do we want to touch on what he's doing on those intensity sessions? I, I don't know. I, I, I'm hoping he didn't give us enough actual context because uh, he only mentions two different types of intervals he's doing. And he's basically just focusing on FTP. Yeah. I just assumed uh, like those are the intervals he's doing right now. Yeah, Those I are mean, the only two workouts you ever do, then yeah, you need to get some more variety that, in there. Hopefully that changes throughout the year and depending on what race you have coming up. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so even, even with this schedule, like you still have to periodize your training throughout the year. Another case of if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. See, okay. yep. Wow, that was the wow. Usually Dylan does the thing where he says what we say better, but Caitlin just did it to Dylan. Caitlin <laughs> took what Dylan said and said it better. Mm -hmm. I knew that I knew that I'd heard that before, but I couldn't think of how to say it. So <laughs> Caitlin, Caitlin said it the best way. All right, cool. Well, I think uh, I think we'll probably wrap it up there. We're gonna get to this next question next week. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. We'll see ya. See ya.